Welcome to The Real Estate Show with Pat Lopez, where we talk everything real estate. Today, my guest is Michael Coyle of the Coyle Group LLC. Michael, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Pat. Appreciate it. Great. Now, um, what is an appraisal? An appraisal is simply an estimate of value. Um, and there are several different types of value, but uh, mainly it's an estimate of value provided by a certified appraiser. Okay. So we're going to get into what makes up an appraisal. But before we do that, tell me your story. How did you get started as an appraiser? Um, I've been appraising for 23 years now and got into it. I uh, was introduced to the profession by a friend. And from there, I was able to uh, find someone to mentor me um, for the requisite amount of hours uh, from there. Uh, I sat for the state exam back in 2000, uh, passed that, and was able to hold myself out as a certified appraiser. Okay. Now, what um, what is needed to actually become an appraiser? I, you have to log X amount of hours. You have to take a test. You know, yeah. What goes into it? That, that's actually evolving right now um, within the state of Pennsylvania. And typically, it's comprised of experiential hours that you're going to acquire while studying or under the mentorship of a certified appraiser, as well as um, classroom hours. So uh, I believe it's 1,500 experiential hours, and they can be accumulated in no less than 12 months. Okay. So that's hours that you've accumulated in the field and in preparing reports and uh, analyzing markets and things like that. And then on the other hand, you also have coursework that you have right. to uh, acquire. Okay, and then you have to sit down for a test, a state? Yep, state certified exam. And uh, once you pass that, you can get your credential. Okay, and then um, if I wanted to become an appraiser, is it easy to find somebody to mentor me? Or is that the term? Or Yeah, that, no, that's exactly what it is. It's a mentorship and apprenticeship. Um, and that is often what I'm finding the most difficult thing for uh, trainees is to find someone to work with them and basically train them for two years or more okay, right. and, and put that kind of time into them. Okay. And then and now how many people do you have working for you? Um, within our office, we use subcontractors. Okay. But over the years, I've trained seven other appraisers. Okay. okay. And and some of them still work with me. Okay. Yeah. And then I, I guess the biggest thing is your time. And then after you train somebody, they just run off and then you invested all this time. Well, that's it. That's, right. well, that's, <laughs> that's the big concern of a lot of appraisers is that I'm, I'm, I'm training my competition. Right. They're going to leave me as soon as they're trained. Um, I've been fortunate in that literally of the seven that um, I trained, five of them, I still have relationships with right. and we work together. Okay. Very good. Yeah. yeah, I can understand how that would be it's, a little difficult. Well, and that's the toughest thing right there. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's jump into an appraisal. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about looking for um, like properties you mentioned. So um, what are you looking for when you're making an appraisal? Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Um, the first thing I want to look at is look at the market. You're going to have your subject property and you're going to want to find uh, properties, sales uh, that are comparable. Right. You're looking for homes that are similar to your to your home in terms of location, size, um, school district, condition, right. things like that. What I often tell people is if people are looking at my home, what other homes that have sold recently that would also satisfy that need? Right. And chances are they're going to be comparable homes and you can look toward them for, you know, an indication of you know, the value. Right. So if I have a house and you say, oh, my house is worth 500000 mm -hmm. because the house across the street, brand new construction, sold for 500000 that really wouldn't be a comparable sale, it, it most may, likely. Yeah. Maybe may more of a, a sale on the street rather right. than a comparable sale. Um, right. <clears throat> however, if you have a 20-year-old house and the 20-year-old house down the street from you with similar square footage and bedroom count, that sold recently, that's probably a pretty good indication of what your home would sell for. Right. So we're looking at square footage. We're looking at bedroom count. Uh, bathroom, condition, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. Basically all the things that would, uh, a buyer might look at that might influence their opinion of a property, what they may say, Hey, look, you know what? I wouldn't buy this property because of X, right. but I would buy it because of, you know, Y. Right. So, okay. Now, um, as far as distance, um, obviously you want to be as close as possible, yeah. but, but what are the parameters? How far can you go out and, and how does that work? Well, that that it really it varies case by case. If you have a situation where, um, say for instance, we are working in a, a Roxborough situation and we've got a three bedroom row home, chances are you're not going to have to go more than a quarter mile or so, or if right. just a few blocks, 
to find comparable sales. And oftentimes, if you go more than those few blocks, you're getting outside the neighborhood. Right. Um, if you have other situations where maybe you're in Upper Bucks County and you're looking at a farm property on 20 acres, you've got a little bit more leeway. Because right. You've got a different buyer who's maybe their parameters might be, you know, I'm going to look within this 20 mile circle. Right. Um, but ideally, you want to find something that is proximate to the subject property and that sold recently. Okay. And, yeah. So you're, we're talking about, and, and generally you can do that within a quarter of a mile or a half a mile? Um, in, in an urban situation, yes. you, you may find yourself that, yeah, yeah, but oftentimes you don't limit yourself to that, that, you know, parameter because there may be some, you know, sales just beyond it. So right. what we try to do is look at it from the point of view is, is this the same market that the buyer is looking at or, right. or that someone looking at our subject property would consider to be same market, same school district, maybe, or, you know, same influence with regard to transportation or right. employment or things like that. Okay. And then as far as time, so um, you're looking at sales, obviously as close mm -hmm. as now, yeah. you know, on there, but how far can you go out as far as time? Well, again, it's one of those situations where each, each appraisal is its own situation and the parameters which that you're using uh, for the search are going to be dictated by that that individual property again if you're in Roxborough chances are you're going to have a higher density population you're going to have more turnover of properties right. and it's going to be easier to find more recent sales if you go into certain other neighborhoods there's especially now with the inventory levels being so low right. there's not much turnover so we've got to expand our sales ideally you know I know all realtors are told you know if we want all our sales to be within 6 months right. and you know we've all want them all to be within a mile we have to sometimes expand the parameters, but if it's a rational decision that makes sense, we can do it. Um, I've seen situations where people have gone, you know, 10, 20 miles to comp out a property right. because it's a very unique situation. Okay. And then on the appraisal itself, you're making comments and saying why you did what you did. Yes. Is that on there? Yes. Um, I was always told that if the appraiser explains himself properly and his right. rationale or her rationale um, behind the decisions they're making and they can point towards data within the market. There's a lot of leeway that an appraiser is going to have that okay. may not fall within the typical underwriting guidelines, but right. they can explain. Yeah. Okay, great. Now, um, condition, that's a biggie, right? So in the example I mentioned, I have brand new construction across the street. My house is 20 years old. Obviously the condition is going to be a little bit different, right? True. So how, how do you break that down? Well, again, we'll go back to our box okay. Uh, situation where again we've got high density with homes are very similar right. and oftentimes the only determiner or things that make things different is the condition maybe you've got one that's completely renovated in the past year versus one that hasn't been touched since the 1970s right and if you look at enough of the data you can actually see um a disparity between those you can see that the more renovated properties are going to fall towards the higher end of the market right. and the homes that need some updating are going to be towards the lower end right. and we can use that to make a determination as to what an appropriate adjustment might be for that particular situation. Okay, and then that sort of rolls right into uh, quality yeah. as well, right? Yeah. So explain quality because that's one of the, you know, br you know, parts of the appraisal. Yeah, yeah. Quality is one of those things. It's very difficult as an appraiser to look at data in the market and say it was quality that set one property apart from another. Mm -hmm. But is it's one of those things that we can look at qualitatively, and most buyers no quality when they see it right. they they say it's it's superior to the subject it's inferior to the subject and we can look at it that way as well and say okay sure we've got two new kitchens but one is a custom kitchen that was you know sixty thousand dollars to put in right and the other one was from ikea right you know they're both new but you look at the quality level right and you know a lot of times that helps us sway one way to or the other in you know the value range that we're looking at right yeah the biggest thing is you know brand new kitchen but one has mm -hmm. formica the other one has granite or yeah. marble or whatever and then yeah. one has a wolf uh, uh, appliance package which is yeah. twenty thousand dollars versus you know a generic frigidaire could yeah. be five or seven thousand dollars and and it's hard, and it's hard for the appraiser to extract that adjustment out of the market right but we can look at it qualitatively and say okay of the five comps I'm looking at, this one is superior because of these finishes. Okay. And, and okay. Now, um, another big one that I get is um, basements. Yes. Uh, how do you look at? <laughs> how do you look at? Did I? Did no, that's it, man. Basements. basements. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, how do you look at basements? Is that part of square footage? You know, uh, you could have a, ba a bathroom down there. You can have a bedroom down there. So, mm -hmm. how do you look at a basement? 
Um, from an appraiser point of view, uh, last year, uh, Fannie Mae said that the appraisers have to use the ANSI guidelines for measuring a property. And the ANSI guidelines are the American National Standards Institute. And basically what that guideline says is that anything below grade is basement space. It can okay. be finished basement space. It could be high quality basement space, but it should not be lumped in with the above grade space. Right. And so what we do is we separate it out. We're going to say that, you know, we've got a thousand square feet of basement space, 500 of which is finished and we right. describe what's down there. And there are areas on the uh, appraisal grid where they can, the appraiser can um, make accommodations for the finished basement. Okay, so um, so that's just a lump sum number. So you would turn around and say a finished basement is fifteen thousand dollars, that hypothetically in this row home, versus the square footage and extra bedroom and everything else. Does that sound about right? Or? Uh, we c we can look at homes that have finished basements in a certain area versus those without, and you can generally say, look, if these are the differences, you can say, okay, here's the difference, and might. Be ten thousand dollars it right. might be whatever but you've got to look at each individual uh, appraisal on its own merits okay okay yeah. so but it's more of a, a finished product as opposed to square footage and room counts and all that yeah. right okay uh, that makes sense mm -hmm. so that yeah that the, you know that's a biggie that you have and, yeah. and of course you could have a house out in the suburbs that have this giant basement I mean, yeah. it's a movie theater bar everything the yeah. whole nine yards it costs them a hundred thousand dollars to put in yep. obviously that's going to be a little bit different than a row home that you may equate ten thousand dollars to maybe yeah. that one is thirty or forty thousand dollars or fifty or whatever and, and that's that's another thing too i mean just because the person put a hundred thousand into the investment doesn't right. mean that they're going to get dollar for dollar return on that right. investment right so Okay, now um, disputes, and mm -hmm. and I'm coming out more of um, a, a realtor, a mortgage company, uh, mm -hmm. a viewpoint here. So if a value comes in less, so let's say I have a house for five hundred thousand, mm -hmm. the appraisal comes in at four hundred and fifty thousand. Okay, um, what do you typically look at if somebody is disputing? Um, the appraisal, you know, what do you want to see? That would be a compelling argument for you to say, you know what? Yeah, maybe they're right. And uh, maybe I can make an adjustment. Yeah, there's, there's actually a formal process called a reconsideration of value. And if the, the buyer or the seller feel that the, the value of the property is too low or, or, right. or maybe the appraiser used in incorrect comps in their mind, it is a process that needs to be initiated through the lender. Right. Because technically the appraiser is working for the lender, even though oftentimes the homeowner or the buyer is paying for the appraisal. Mm -hmm. Our client is the lender. So any changes we make to the appraisal report have to be um, initiated by the lender. So what I would recommend doing is gathering information because the, the best way to um, get a reconsideration of value is to provide good data. And data that says, okay, maybe a value of this area, you know, is indicated. Right. You just can't go in there and say, hey, I don't like the value because right. it doesn't work. Um, so what I would say is uh, I would recommend getting a few comparables that support your opinion. Right. Okay. Provide them to the lender and explain to, in a, you know, an email or a letter to the lender. We would like, um, we would like to ask the appraiser for a reconsideration of value based right. on these sales. This is why we feel that they're superior. They were, um, Closer to the subject property, they were, you know, very similar in terms of square footage, condition, that right, type right, of thing. Right. The lender will then the lender actually has the option of providing it to the appraiser or not providing it. Most of the time, they will provide it to the appraiser. Right. The appraiser generally is going to have a day or so to look it over, um, and then address the concerns there and either incorporate those sales into the report or explain why they aren't appropriate Using it. or right. why the other uh, comparables used in the report are more appropriate. Right. So. Right. So, but that going to be commented on the appraisal. Yes, it'll it'll most likely be addressed in an addendum, um, which is attached to the you know to the appraisal at some point. Yeah. Right. And 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 from what I've seen, there are some people reconsider value, some don't. And I've seen one where a house right next door yeah. sold, and because let's say the house sold for you know two hundred thousand, the subject is two hundred thousand, and this house sold for two fifty, the appraiser was just looking yeah. for a range of two twenty five yeah. and missed it. So, so there could be, you know, appraisers are human. So sure. there could be, they miss something or it could be, once again, the scenario, Hey, I have this 20 year, uh, 20 year old house, brand new construction across the street. Uh, maybe that's yeah. not the, <laughs> well, that's <laughs> it. Well, it kind of falls back into the, um, when you're selecting comparables, if you select comparables that are similar to the home and the appraiser is not maybe looking at it from a value range. Right. He, he may pick up that, that, song, that, uh, sale. Right. Um, I've actually seen it too where, Everyone gets hung up on the six month and the 12 month, uh, you know, 
we can only go back 12 right. months for a sale. I've seen it where the house next door may have sold 13 months ago and it's an excellent comp right. and gets overlooked because it falls outside that. I know in our office, we generally open up our search a little bit further just in case we get those kind of right. things. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, okay. And then uh, on an investment property, um, that is looked at a little bit differently because we're using the rent analysis in there, right? Yeah. yeah so basically. how does that work? Well, you're basically looking at it on um, the property as, as aside from just from what comparables are in the area, right. you're looking at it from investment potential as well. Can this investment generate um, as much money as a competing investment, that type of thing? So you're looking at cap rates and gross rent multipliers and, you know, what kind of current rents they can get versus projected rents. Right. And these all fall into uh, into play when looking at investment properties. Right. Yes. Okay, good. Now, um, generally, when somebody's buying a house, they'll go through the mortgage company. The mortgage company then has a uh, management company where they'll order the appraisal through. Yeah. But um, when are there times where people contact you directly because they need an appraisal? You know, what are the, some of those scenarios? Yeah, we, we do a lot of what we call private work, which is generally non-lending work. And it might revolve around tax assessment appeal or divorce estate and probate work. Um, we do a good deal of work with Orphan's Court, right. uh, which is basically for guardianship and things of that matter. Um, we help a lot of agents out with pre-listings right. uh, and things like that. We also do uh, work with um, immigration appraisals when people are trying to apply for visas right. and such like that. They have to be sponsored and then those sponsors have to demonstrate that they've got property that's you know worth what it is and then they can sponsor the person coming okay, into so the property. Th so there's a lot outside of just the normal process of buying a house that totally. you can be of service to people. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Now, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, how would they do that? Well, um, you can either give us a call. Our office is 215-836-5500, or you can always shoot me an email at mcoil at coilappraisals.com. Okay. Yeah. And then um, just want to finish up with, um, I read in your bio, you have a blog and a yeah. Facebook group. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we have a blog. Um, it's called the Philly Appraisal Blog, and it's been around for, I think, over 10 years now. Okay. And we basically just, you know, address real estate uh, in the area, Philadelphia type things. Um, but we also have a Facebook group of, I think, 600 some members. And it's specifically geared at uh, agents and brokers. It's called Appraisers Helping Philadelphia Real Estate Agents. Okay. And it's a place where agents can go and ask appraisal related questions. Um, we have a number of appraisers uh, that are certified throughout the country that can address questions um for instance, one of the fellows uh, that's in the group is an appraiser from California. He's an expert in solar. And the the information that he has regarding solar, which is just really starting to come into right. our market mm -hmm. and influence things. Um, we have some some lenders. We have some attorneys that are part of the group and things like that. But it's just a place where you're not going to find, you know, so-and-so's listing a property. Right. But it's going to be a fall towards the higher end of the market. Right. Is this a VA issue? Is this an FHA issue? Um, how do I handle this? Right. And, and we'll have appraisers and other agents chime in and, and help you out if you can. That's great. That's yeah. great. It's really informative, especially if you have a question, you can uh, shoot out there and uh, put the question out and then you'll respond or somebody will respond in the group. Yeah, right? yeah. Feel free to look it up. Um, have a couple of questions, answer, at, be part of the group, but we're always looking to expand it. Okay, perfect. Um, well, thank you for being on the show. Thank really you informative. I, yeah. I learned a lot here. <laughs> I know I asked probably some really stupid questions, but, you know, thank you for being kind and, I, you know, give me dirty looks. Uh, <laughs> and uh, be sure to, if anybody has any questions, uh, go to the Facebook group or contact you uh, directly. Well, that's The Real Estate Show with Pat Lopez. Be sure to follow the show on Facebook and Instagram and subscribe below. I have some great guests and some great content lined up for you. Also, if, leave a comment on some show topics you want me to cover in the future. Remember, this show is everything real estate, no limits. Hope you enjoyed the show and have a great day.